All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining today. My name is Megan Donnelly, and I am the Nutrition Services Manager and Registered Dietitian at Dr. Shar USA. Hope you're all staying healthy and safe during this time. I know things are a little crazy, so I really do appreciate you taking the time to log into this lecture. Um, today, I'm going to share what I hope is an informative presentation on the benefits of culinary education in chronic kidney disease and hopefully give you some tools that will help you implement this sort of education as well. All right, so here's my contact information. Feel free to email me with questions after the presentation. Uh, quickly address a few logistical items before we get started. Um, your certificates as of participation, as well as a copy of the slides, will be emailed to you after the webinar has ended. This webinar has been approved for one continuing education unit by the Committee on Dietetic Registration. If you don't receive a certificate via email, please email me and I will make sure you get it ASAP. Um, I'm also going to be recording this webinar and posting it on the Dr. Shar Institute website for on-demand viewing. Um, you will have access to that webinar and all of the info will be provided in the email following the webinar. I'll just need to wait a couple of days until the CDR approves the recorded version for for credit before I can post it. Um, feel free to type your questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A tab or the comments um, channel, and I'll try to address them at the end as time permits. If I miss anything, feel free to send it again or again, email me afterwards. All right, so here are the learning objectives for the presentation. After the module, you should be able to demonstrate the importance of culinary education in the nutrition care process. Identify barriers that interfere with adoption of low protein diets in CKD patients. Describe the impact of culinary education on behavior mediators, including self-efficacy and cooking skills. And develop and run programs that support patients to implement dietary changes via educational tools, cooking demos, meal planning, and other resources. All right, and here's just a short outline of what you can expect in the presentation. I won't go through it here, but for your reference. All right, so here we go. Um, there are a number of nutritional factors that strongly influence CKD incidence and progression, and therefore nutrition is really central to CKD management, which I'm sure most of you are dietitians on this call and you're fully aware of this. Uh, early intervention may positively influence disease evolution. When a person has CKD, nutrient absorption and a number of metabolic pathways are interrupted. Additionally, buildup of uremic toxins may impair appetite, leading to malnutrition. Studies show that, interve that nutritional interventions mitigate risk for uremia, malnutrition, and progression to dialysis. An individualized dietary counseling and follow-up, which we call medical nutrition therapy, should be a routine part of the care for people with CKD. I want to emphasize that prevention is really critical in this population, especially given the financial and emotional burden of end-stage renal disease and dialysis treatments. The total annual cost of end-stage renal disease treatments in the U.S. is estimated to be over $27 billion per year, which translates to about $90,000 spent on medical treatments per patient each year, and that's really on the low end. Um, research shows that dietary interventions are effective for delaying CKD progression. Unfortunately, nearly 90% of patients with CKD do not receive any nutrition counseling prior to dialysis initiation, which is really for a variety of reasons, but some of them are lack of proper diagnosis, lack of symptoms, perceived cost of seeing a dietitian, and lack of access to a dietitian. I do want to point out that this is hopefully changing with the new executive order by the president which stipulates that prevention methods must be in place in order to reduce the number of patients progressing to dialysis by 25% by 2030. Additionally, the new Kudogi guidelines expected to be released in this July, July 2020, will prioritize nutrition interventions in this population and take a more aggressive approach to the pre-dialysis nutrition interventions. As I'm sure most of you know, hypertension and type 2 diabetes are two major risk factors and comorbidities in CKD, so significant effort should also be made to manage these conditions in their earliest stages. 
A dietitian should provide individualized diet prescription that takes CKD stage into account, as well as comorbidities, potential CKD-related complications, and dietary preferences. Always important to consider preferences. Dietary modifications in CKD also require patient education and close monitoring to manage the risks of malnutrition and hyperkalemia. There are a number of... Um, Oh, sorry, I think I skipped a slide here, but um, we're going to move on. So several important dietary constituents have a role in kidney disease or common comorbidities, which are diabetes and hypertension, and these may all be subject to modification. These nutrients of concern include sodium, phosphorus, fat quality, potassium, and fiber. Protein intake is now considered to be the cornerstone of nutritional management in CKD, which I'll discuss in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, it is also critical that CKD patients consume enough calories and fiber in order to maintain weight and a healthy gut microbiome. Daily supplements of vitamins and trace elements may be recommended if deficiencies exist. All right, so this is a prevention schematic recently proposed by Dr. Kalantar. He's a major nephrologist in this space who's a really big advocate the CKD is means of prevention. I wanted to show it here to highlight the necessary prevention targets where nutrition therapy is indicated. Primary prevention really includes care before a person has CKD, and it involves management of conditions that are risk factors for it. General healthy diet and lifestyle changes to maintain healthy weight, blood pressure, and blood sugar level are recommended in this stage. Secondary prevention is getting at the early stage CKD patient. Here, a nephrologist is usually involved, and more intensive medical nutrition therapy is indicated. This is where the low-protein diet can be especially beneficial. Management of hypertension and type 2 diabetes are also definitely critical, especially if we're trying to manage all three of them at the same time. Tertiary prevention occurs when kidney function is already significantly diminished and renal replacement therapy is required or almost happening. In this case, the goal is to manage the needs of the patient who is on dialysis. Importantly, the calorie and protein needs are higher in that group. This graphic shows the major nutrition-related recommendations from all the major guidelines, including the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and Kidogi. The recommendations regarding dietary intakes of protein, sodium, phosphate, and potassium are shown here. Um, and so they, they differ a little bit, but generally they are the same. So for, for phosphorus, we're usually talking around 800 milligrams per day, although we know that's hard to quantify as it's not really on nutrition labels in most cases. Um, potassium restriction, only necessary if a person has hyperkalemia, but the recommendation there is, you know, let about 4.7 grams per day maximum, um, but we don't necessarily need to restrict unless blood levels are high. Sodium, the recommendations vary a little bit, but generally around less than 2.3 grams per day. And low protein, which is 0.6 to 0.8 grams per day. And again, I'm going to talk more about that. The nutrition therapy gets more um, more strict, really, as the disease progresses in an effort to delay the progression to dialysis. So again, a low-protein diet is defined as 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight per day, which is the current recommendation for patients with CKD. In this group, half of the daily protein intake should come from high biologic value sources to ensure adequate amino acid delivery, and at least half should come from plant-based sources. In fact, plant-based diets are strongly indicated in this population as means of delaying progression of the disease. A moderately low protein diet defined as 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram body weight per day is recommended for healthy people and oftentimes people with diabetes, um, but in particular patients at risk for CKD. So we're getting at that primary prevention here. So general healthy people, 0.8 to 1 gram, it's the same. 
um, for high-risk CKD patients. Once you are diagnosed with CKD, protein recommendations are lower. Regardless of which population patients fall under, most need support in understanding and implementing these types of recommendations. Another benefit to the low-protein diet is that it is inherently lower in sodium and phosphorus, which are two other components of medical nutrition therapy and CKD that we're going to touch on briefly as we go, although today the focus is really culinary education. Okay, this slide explains the proposed biological mechanism behind the efficacy of a low-protein diet and its effect in the kidney. A low-protein diet reduces blood flow to the glomerulus, lowering intraglomerular pressure. Eventually, this stabilizes GFR and preserves kidney function. A low-protein diet also reduces uremia and uremic symptoms through decreased urea generation. On the other hand, excessive protein intake places stress on the kidneys and over time reduces its function. Interestingly, you can see the impact of excessively high protein intake among many bodybuilders and athletes who have consumed extremely high amounts of protein for extended periods of time, and oftentimes it leads to kidney failure. And has wide-ranging impact. Patients obviously don't need to understand everything on this slide in full, but it's important that they understand how monitoring key nutrients in their diet, like protein, phosphorus, sodium, can play a role in delaying dialysis. If you'd like more information on the evidence for a low protein diet and this mechanism and all the health outcomes, I really encourage you to view the webinar that's on the Dr. Shar Institute website about medical nutrition therapy and CKD. We originally hosted this in 2019 and it really takes an in-depth look at most of these clinical benefits and describes the mechanisms. So I encourage you to go look at that. It's also been approved for one continuing education unit by the CDR. So I'm gonna leave this here, but if you're interested, I really encourage you to go look at that. Okay, so obviously patient adherence to a low protein diet helps achieve renal protective goals. A recent feasibility study found that protein restriction using an individualized stepwise approach was achievable in an overall elderly high comorbidity population. So 50% of these people had diabetes and 40% had obesity. Um, this method really takes on a patient-centered approach that included a food-first method to nutrition education, individual, individualized preferences, regular communication and follow-up, and social support. All of these things empower patients to make appropriate food choices that align with their health goals. Certain healthy eating patterns may help prevent cardiovascular events and reduce mortality in these patients, and I just wanted to mention them here. The DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet have been proposed as helpful approaches in CKD. However, what I really want to point out here is that these two diets are really getting at healthy eating patterns, which include those healthy eating patterns for the general population, not just CKD. These diets are plant-forward, high in fiber, and low in animal-based proteins, processed foods, saturated fat, sugar, and sodium. In addition, high fiber and plant-based vegetarian diets are of interest as a means of reducing gut absorption of uremic toxins and CKD. So vegetarian diets have been associated with reduced prevalence of CD, CKD. Whichever approach you take with your patients in terms of whatever you call it, the basic healthy principles are really the same. Maintaining a healthy weight, lifestyle, and diet full of plants, not a lot of animal-based foods, which, are, which tend to be high in saturated fat, sodium, and protein, and phosphorus. Okay, so now I'm going to get into a little bit about the behavior change theories. This may be something you haven't thought about since your DPD days, um, but it's really important to consider these when trying to build effective dietary interventions. Here we have the trans-theoretical model of change. It's used to tailor interventions based on a patient's stage of change. So we have pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. Those are the main ones. It's used to tailor intervention. Um, sorry, the focus of the lecture is culinary education. So I'm going to put these into con context of culinary education for the purposes of this presentation. But these can really be applied throughout the nutrition care process. 
Culinary education targets those in the pre-contemplation, contemplation, and preparation stages. And patients in these stages don't necessarily have an awareness that they need to change for pre-contemplation. They may be ambivalent about change due to perceived barriers, such as unacceptable taste of food, economic constraints, and inconvenience. That's more contemplation. Or maybe they've resolved their ambivalence and are committed to action, but need the skills and knowledge to make that change. That's preparation. Culinary education can resolve these barriers by clarifying the ambivalence to change, encouraging a support network as they take steps to prepare, emphasize expected benefits, and promote self-efficacy and decision-making skills. They might also build a social network through group classes and try new recipe in class, which can really, really be motivating. Also important to note that the change can be gradual, continuous, and dynamic, and so patients may bounce around these stages at different points, depending on different things going on in their lives. I want to briefly discuss some of the factors that may influence readiness to change, as well as ways to communicate in a way that actually motivates this change. In nutrition education programs, Nutrition knowledge refers to communicating information about basic facts about food and nutrition, such as the MNT for CKD that I described before, you know, the numbers. This is when you'll see handouts like this typically, and a lot of times dietitians, and this is a good way, but a lot of times dietitians use handouts like this to just review with patients. This is really giving people a functional knowledge that involves capacity to obtain and understand information. Using nutrition knowledge as a marker of success can be a little bit problematic because it doesn't address underlying motivation, motivational factors. Thus, nutrition education seems to imply that the function of dietetics is to provide education, meaning knowledge and information. Um, but really, that's not an accurate representation of what education is. Education is not just about providing information. It's also about enhancing motivation and facilitating dietary change. So, while giving someone knowledge, though necessary for them for action, it's unlikely to lead to improved behavior by itself in those who are not already motivated or ready to take action. So studies show that there's a link between nutrition literacy and behavior, and that doesn't necessarily account for motivation to change. That being said, food and nutrition information can be communicated in such a way as to enhance motivation for behavior change, which is really the purpose of this lecture. So as you'll see here, there is a role for providing this information according to this, um, actually Jane Sherman is the person who created this chart, so we'll give her credit there. Um, so, you know, this type of thing can be successful when an individual or community perceives there's a problem, believes change is needed and urgent, is seeking a solution, has experience of success in the past, has the means, sees that the change is easy and attractive, is not tempted by other actions, they can see the benefit, and they have social approval and support. If these other conditions are lacking, simply if these conditions in this chart here are lacking, simply providing the information is not going to be an effective way to get someone to follow your diet prescription. You really need to have these motivational factors. All right, so I know this is a little busy, but I'm going to try to um, try to explain it for you. This is an adaptation from one of my nutrition education books by Isabel Contento, which is cited on the, the slide and in the references. Definitely encourage you to take a look. It's important for nutrition educators to realize that many factors influence eating behaviors and that nutrition education needs to develop these strategies to address each of these things. This figure represents the ways in which biological, experiential, personal, social, and environmental determinants influence food choice and diet-related practices. Note that all of these are related to each other and each larger circle encompasses the influence of the smaller circles. As you'll see here, nutrition knowledge is just one of the many determinants of food choice and diet-related behaviors. Interestingly, studies show that most Americans feel like they're knowledgeable about nutrition, with about 75% of consumers saying they always or most of the time felt comfortable selecting healthy foods at the grocery store. However, many of these same people also indicated that they were aware that their diets need improvement, which clearly indicates that there's something other than health influencing their choices. 
I think as dietitians, sometimes we lose sight of this and get very discouraged when our education efforts seem to go ignored. And this is why it's so important to understand why our clients and patients make the choices that they do. And it's our job to help them make better choices with respect to those factors. So the main theme for today's lecture is culinary education, which can address many of this information. Um, so hopefully you can apply some of these things, but I encourage you to think about all of this in the context of culinary education as we go through. Dietitians, we use both cognitive and skills-based strategies to promote change. So here are some specific activities to build into a culinary education program. Note how both cognitive and behavioral change, as well as skills development, use hands-on application and group-based social activities. Some ways to promote cognitive and behavioral change include building social interactions into your programs, holding experience experiential learning like tasting periods and sharing food and also promoting group discussion. Um, a lot of times people really identify with others in the group so it's always good to get your groups talking. On the other hand some ways to promote skills development include group-based um, lectures and cooking sessions with hands-on applications encouraging participants to submit their own content and recipe selection and working with them to put it in the context of the diet you're trying to educate on um, and structuring any type of education so that people are working as a team because collaboration can often lead to a better outcome. In general, hands-on application is always preferred. Okay, finally getting into the main focus of this presentation, which is culinary education. So first, I'm going to define a few things so that we're all on the same page. Uh, culinary literacy, literacy is defined as a holistic approach to describe the practices needed to enable nutritious meal preparations and to meet nutrition recommendations. It includes planning, management, budgeting, selection, preparation, and consumption of food. So really getting at a lot of those determinants. It looks at the skills a patient has. So we'd say culinary education seeks to promote culinary literacy among participants. There are many aspects to culinary literacy, including cooking skills, competence, and nutrition knowledge. This really gets at functional knowledge and understanding as well as skill development. Culinary literacy is geared towards increasing knowledge of food and nutrition related practices, skill building, self-efficacy, attitudes, and nutrition principles. And culinary education programs target these categories of culinary literacy to promote various outcomes. The primary outcomes include improved food security, healthier diet patterns, and creation of an environment that supports healthy eating patterns. Secondary outcomes include improved health, decreased obesity and cardiovascular disease rate, increased self-sufficiency, and improved family relationships. And these are not all inclusive. These are just examples. Um, patients exist across a spectrum from culinary literate to culinary illiterate. So in designing programs, you must understand where your patients fall among that spectrum and tailor, tailor the content accordingly. Effective culinary education programs empower patients with skills and knowledge needed to build and adhere to a diet that fits their needs. It must provide a flexible framework, not rigid, not rigid rules and precise quantities of nutrients. Acknowledging that patients may have different needs and working with them to build the diet program together is empowering and facil facilitates adherence. Strict limits on ingredients, portion intake, and nutrient values is counterproductive, difficult for patients to understand, and typically unrealistic for them to follow. So here is an example of an effective program. It's called Jamie's Ministry of Food, and I encourage you to look it up. Um, it's a community-based cooking skills program that teaches adults cooking skills to prepare nutritious meals at home. So this wasn't necessarily CKD focused, just general health. Um, it provided messages about good nutrition, meal planning, and budgeting all in the program. And the sessions emphasized cooking from scratch using fresh ingredients such as fish, meat, and seasonal fruits and vegetables. 
A key component is that hands-on cooking sessions where participants applied knowledge were shared during the lecture portion of each session. Um, so after, so with this program, researchers evaluated the impact of the cooking skills program across a range of culinary literacy related outcomes. It's important to know how skill based objectives are paired with knowledge and confidence based objectives. For the purposes of this study, the content was adapted for the UK and Australian audiences to ensure that the messaging was locally relevant. And as you can see here, there were clear improvements in dietary habits and self-efficacy beliefs, including confidence in fruit and vegetable consumption. Results were sustained over a long period of time as well, so the things that people learned during this program stuck with them, and they were actually more successful in the long term. Now, we always say keep it short and simple, but really short, simple, attractive advice has the most impact in most populations, including CKD. Um, patients are more likely to adhere to a low protein diet when they have participated in building it to fit their preferences and needs, which I mentioned before. Um, in this study, researchers looked at the best way to deliver advice. The results showed that guidance that provides skills, knowledge, and tips resulted in the highest rate of adherence. This is because patients were able to adapt the guidelines to fit their preferences and needs and didn't feel overwhelmed by the information. So you'll see in this study, a simplified dietary approach for the low-protein diet was evaluated compared to normal education, which was more in-depth. Um, and you'll see that the patients had approved outcomes. They were using this six tips approach. And the six tips are in the box on the side. Um, so do not add salt while cooking or eating. Avoiding salami, sausages, cheeses, or dairy products. Replacing noodles or bread with protein-free products. This was an Italian study, so consume the second course, meat, fish, and eggs only once a day, because in Italy it's very common for pasta to be a first course. So um, consume four, four to five servings per day of fruits and vegetables. And once a week, the main course may be a normal noodle with legumes instead of a second course with fruit and vegetables. So really simple tips that were applicable to the culture um, and the population they were working with. And these patients had improved outcomes. This is especially relevant for people who don't have access to dietitians and resources on a regular basis. So um, they, they play, play in even greater role in the meal planning, preparation, and food selection themselves with simple things to remember. Culinary education really can be part of the nutrition care process, and I think this is important to highlight. Here are some examples on this slide. I'm going to go through them. Um, culinary education programs must be built to target factors that influence the diet. I've been saying this a lot. Um, some of these include cooking confidence, consumption habits, and compliance with the CKD diet. So for cooking confidence, which is really the ability to adequately measure ingredients, cut up fruits and vegetables, follow a recipe, use fresh ingredients, or be comfortable with basic culinary techniques, um, things you're going to look at to, as your outcomes are changes in self-esteem and confidence, the ability to follow a recipe, the ability to make a meal from raw ingredients, and willingness to prepare new foods. Those are good outcomes measures when you're trying to assess cooking confidence. For diet and consumption, say you want to increase fruit and vegetable consumption via exposure to new foods to inc increase their range of preferences. Um, you might look at the changes in their dietary practices measured by usual snack consumption. You might look at takeaway meals and their composition, look at the amount of sodium on nutrition labels, a lot of times if patients start to do that, that's a good sign that they're trying to follow your advice. Um, and maybe they eliminated salty snacks from the diet. Um, assessing compliance can be a little bit hard, um, but you really want to look at their understanding of the basic recommendations. And some ways you can do this are how they cook pasta, rice, and cereal with less salt, if they're, if they're starting to use more spices instead of salt-containing ingredients, if they're using fresh or frozen foods more often, if they're cutting back on their frozen dinners, if they're rinsing their canned foods to remove sodium. So these are all ways that you may be able to assess compliance without something like a food journal.
Now remember on a previous slide, I showed that there are a lot of determinants or factors that influence the diet. And here I wanted to show how culinary education actually targets and breaks down many of the barriers to compliance. Um, one I'm gonna highlight is lack of tangible knowledge, understanding and social acceptance around cooking. Um, so culinary education provides outsized benefits to the vulnerable, low-income, and socially deprived adults and their families by helping them overcome a range of barriers to healthful food preparation. These might include not knowing how to cook, lack of budget and budgeting skills, social isolation and stigma, limited access to food. So culinary education can really combat a lot of these things by showing them how to cook meals on a budget, things that, you know, might be help, helpful things, helpful tips when you don't have a lot of time to prepare. So things like that. Um, for patients on a low protein diet, culinary education can support adherence by breaking down barriers that undermine self-efficacy, such as limited one-to-one -one counseling time. If you give people the skills to practice culinary education, the, the ability to cook for themselves, they'll be more likely to be successful when you're not there to help them in their everyday. Um, when they don't understand how to support a low-protein diet. So again, culinary education, it's a food-first approach. It's going to help them understand what they need to do. And it'll also help them have a more personalized diet approach because you're inherently um, giving them a prescription with food that it fits their preferences and culture. All right, so how do we put it all together? So I'm going to go through how to create effective culinary education programs and this is um we could talk about this forever so it's just a brief overview but i um, just want to remind you of a few things to get started so here are some things to consider when building a nutrition education program for individuals or groups it's also relevant in the culinary setting which is why i bring it up here it's critical to assess your audience before creating any type of nutrition program or you know even in your regular counseling session a systematic assessment, which helps you better understand your audience, ensures that your plan matches what the audience needs, provides a basis for which behaviors to focus on, clearly identifies which behaviors should be a priority, identifies what you will need to be successful in terms of resources, and provides a basis for measuring results. This type of assessment ensures that your program is directed at issues, needs, or interests that are important to that person that you are working with. Um, so performing a needs assessment prior to any nutrition education program really is critical. And I know you guys know this. A lot of times if you're working individually with a patient, you know, you perform a needs assessment a little bit by speaking to the patient and also by reading their chart. Um, but in a group, it's even more important to do a needs assessment to make sure you're meeting the needs of the group. Um, presentation format can really affect how your group interprets the information you're presenting who your audience is in terms of age, literacy level, language, etc., very much determines how your audience will respond to a specific format. I want to point out that all of these can actually be used in the context of culinary education. So keep in mind um, that you, we, these can be applied in a variety of different ways. They should also all be culturally appropriate. Uh, lecture is the predominant educational delivery method used still. Um, it's how most people are taught, and so a lot of people feel more comfortable teaching this way. Um, it's beneficial because it can be used for delivering a lot of information at once. In this format, group participants are passive, which is a challenge for the educator. Since people only remember about 10% of what they hear and can only listen for about 10 minutes at a time, lectures are more effective in short, palatable bites. Visual aids, such as charts, graphs, and pictures, enhance the presentation of the material. In culinary education, lectures may be helpful for setting the stage for a specific cooking skill, recipe, or menu plan. Discussions can be useful in many settings and are particularly useful in conjunction with a lecture. In fact, many educators are shifting towards this lecture discussion method. Discussions provide individuals with the opportunity to voice their comments or concerns and create an environment for idea generation. This can be a challenge, however, when groups or individuals are uncomfortable for any reason, as when there are differences in language, learning ability, and so on. Um, in terms of culinary, you might be thinking more of the second two, which um, the first of which is demonstrations. 
Demonstrations can serve a lot of functions. Cooking demos, for example, teach skills and enhance the likelihood that individuals will feel confident in their ability to take action. However, these types of programs are really reliant on resources and may be costly and time consuming. Active hands-on learning experiences are very effective methods for delivering information. Some examples of active learning experience that are culinary related are cooking classes and grocery store and farmers market tours, but li limitations are similar to those of um, demonstrations. They can be resource and uh, cost heavy. I do want to take some time to discuss creating programs for low literacy audiences. There are a lot of not so obvious reasons that someone might have trouble following a typical classroom environment, including language barriers or hearing and vision problems. I find that this is often true in the CKD population, especially because this population tends to be a little bit older. So here are some helpful strategies that are that can be useful when creating better programs all around, but with consideration for lower literacy adults. So assessing your audience before the program starts, focusing on behaviors and actions rather than facts, using a variety of presentation methods and visuals, using common words and short sentences, frequently repeating and reviewing, and remaining friendly and respectful throughout the entire program, of course. All right, so now I'm gonna highlight how meal plans can fit into this overall picture of culinary education. I've been telling you about how kidney-friendly diet prescriptions should be individualized, practical, and simple enough for the patient to follow. And this is so important for the patient to really be successful. The diet needs to fit into a patient's lifestyle, not go against it. So it should be focused on real food and not unnecessary supplementation. It also should be focused on how to prepare whole foods and not processed foods and frozen meals. Um, those things can be useful, but they're not necessarily required and probably won't deliver the best nutritional benefit. Um, they sh the diet really shouldn't be so rigid. Life changes. You can't always predict how your next meal is going to be prepared. So in reality, adopting healthy eating patterns to improve kidney health is the point of this diet prescription. That being said, patients need help, and this is where the role of meal plans really comes into play. You might be thinking that introducing a meal plan is too prescriptive and goes against everything I just said. And also as a dietitian, I know it can be really time consuming to create these types of things. Um, but really well-designed meal plans should be adaptable. They should be simple. Giving out recipes is one thing, but a lot of patients are intimidated by cooking and need additional support, especially in the beginning. So the information on this by a fellow dietitian that I've worked with, Jean Petrucci, um, and she's a culinary education specialist. So here are some ways that culinary education can be applied in practice. And as you can see, it has multiple, it has a role in multiple steps of the nutrition care process. The first is medical nutrition therapy and counseling. Culinary education during MNT is a practical approach and doesn't have to involve getting in the kitchen just yet. This is a good opportunity to educate on food versus nutrition, assess culinary ability, assess resources, set cooking goals, and, and address environmental and social factors. Next, there's the role of culinary education in creating evidence-based programs. There's a lot to consider here, and these things can occur at the individual or the group level. How are you going to reach your patients and make sure they understand the material? Often, a variety of materials are required. You need to select an interesting topic, offer it in multiple mediums, provide measurable objectives, create handouts, conduct cooking demos, goals. These are all things that can help your patients follow the diet better. But finally, you can take this a step further to work on the food and culinary experience. These are some of the things that can really drive home the MNT and bring it to life for the patients. You can offer meal plans, grocery lists, cookbooks, send them recipes according to their culinary ability, incorporate food-focused themes into events, incorporate food information and recipe blogs, and offer cooking classes to help patients really tackle these things. So as I mentioned before, meal plans can be extremely helpful tools. To drive this home, I thought it'd be helpful to show you some examples of what a meal plan can look like. 
Um, for the last several months, I've been working on creating a CKD meal plan with um, Dr. Kalandar, who I mentioned before, and a few other colleagues of mine. Um, you'll see one day of it on this slide. All of the days that I'll show you are designed for a 70 kilogram person, just for your reference. There's just a few things I want to point out here. I won't get into the details of the meal plan. The first is that the nutritional goals I outlined in my earlier slides are all met here. The vast majority of the protein is coming from plant-based sources, and there's also some low-protein grain-based foods in there. The diet includes some of those high-potassium foods that a lot of patients are told they can never have again once they have kidney disease, which is a huge pet peeve of mine. Um, um, a lot of times patients just receive handouts with old in information and they don't have any context about fiber and portion control and so they just restrict unnecessarily. This type of meal plan is helpful because it shows patients how they can actually put their education into practice from a food first approach. Um, now I know that creating these can be time consuming and frustrating which I'm going to address in a minute so don't worry. <laughs> All right, here's another day of the meal plan. Uh, all, the, all these look really delicious, right? Um, so I don't have a teaching kitchen. I'm sure many of you don't either, especially if you're in the hospital setting. But there are ways to teach patients how to cook. I think cooking demos are really powerful tools in person and via video. For me, one thing that seems to work is using library classrooms um, for teaching as, as a sort of teaching kitchen. They usually don't charge much. There's they, you can prepare something that doesn't a lot, involve a lot of cooking on site. If you're in the hospital, sometimes it's easy to just do a sampling day where you're just preparing something. Um, these types of programs have been pretty successful for me, um, and I think that they're, the, the way you can pitch them if you're working for a larger organization is that this is going to improve the outcome for the patient if they see hands-on what you're doing. You can also do, you know, a pre-recorded video of yourself preparing a, a pizza or something. There's a lot of ways you can get around this if you feel like you don't have access to a teaching kitchen. All right, here's a third day. This is the last day I'm going to show you of this plan. Um, now, you might be thinking that it requires a lot of cooking and what patient wants to cook every day. Um, I don't have the recipe instructions on the slides here, but actually most of these recipes can, pre can be prepared in five steps or less. Um, I'd also like to point out that they're all appropriate for a patient to include on the diet in any day. So when building meal plans, a lot of patient education to go, should go into showing them how to make practical adjustments to meet their needs, preferences, and their life. Um, I think meal plans are a really great starting point for patients, and they don't necessarily need to be something that someone follows for the long term. They're a teaching tool. Uh, this is also a good point to discuss meal prepping and using leftovers. So when I design meal plans for a patient, I always leave some days blank and call them free days to encourage patients to make their own decisions and empower them to put their education into practice. You know, maybe a patient really liked that zucchini pancake from, recipe, from the day one plan and wants to have it with their omelet on the free day. Great. Or maybe they came up with a new recipe that they're excited about and want to share. Amazing. This type of critical critical thinking should be encouraged, and most people can't follow a strict regimen forever. So really, that is what you want to get out of this, is eventually the patient feels empowered to make the decisions on their own. Okay, wrapping up, so we have some time for questions. Um, so I've shown you how medical nutrition therapy can improve outcomes in CKD patients. But these patients really need support in order to be successful. This is a really complicated diet. When educating a patient, it's important to prioritize simple and realistic recommendations that align with culture, preferences, and financial situations. Give them the tools that will help them adhere to and enjoy the diet. Um, this requires significant understanding of determinants of food and nutrition-related behaviors. Individual considerations should be made for each patient in order to be successful in motivating any sort of change. And in my experience, meal plans and recipes are some of the most helpful tools in this population. Okay, so now I have to go into the self-assessment. I am going to do this pretty quickly. So as I go through, um, just type your answers into the chat box or the Q&A, and we'll try to move through these so we have time for questions, and I want to show you guys some of the resources that we have available. Okay, 
So aside from protein, which nutrients are important to consider when initiating MNT for patients with CKD? Okay, and that's a unanimous answer. Nice, all, yes. Um, the correct answer is all of the above. Okay. For which patients with CKD do the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics guidelines recommend a low protein diet with 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram per day? All right, so there's some question here. And so really the answer is C, non-diabetic patients with a GFR of less than 50 milliliters. So really a CKD patient who's non-diabetic. Remember I did say with, with diabetes, um, the recommendations currently say that um, a little more protein may be indicated in an effort to not cause hyperglycemia. Okay, what are the potential benefits of medical nutrition therapy with a low protein, low sodium and high fiber diet? All right, you guys are good. <laughs> Everyone's pretty much sending in the same answer. So yes, the answer is E, all of the above. Okay, and final question. Uh, culinary literacy describes which of the following? All right, so this is just a definition, um, but yes, the answer is C. So a lot of you got this one. Um, culinary literacy is the planning, management, budgeting, selection, preparation, and consumption of food. Um, all the other things are involved in the culinary education process. Okay, I'm gonna open it up for questions right now. We'll do a couple minutes, uh, maybe like five minutes of questions, and then I'll just show you some of the re resources that I have for meal planning. Okay. Um, someone's asking if we'll have access to the talk when it's done. Yes, you will. I'll be giving the slides to you as well as posting it on the Dr. Shar Institute website. Um, okay. Okay, wondering where one could find low protein bread and pizza crust. I will be showing you that after the presentation. I can, I definitely have some help with that one. All right, you guys can feel free to keep sending in the questions. Right now we don't have any, so I am gonna move on to um, some of the resources and then feel free to keep um, sending them in. Here are the references. Um, so I don't know if you guys have heard of Living Plate Rx meal planning software, but this is a free software available to healthcare providers. Um, it's a, it, it really is a well-designed program um, designed by the dietitian Jean Petrucci that I mentioned before. Um, all of the recipes that I showed you are included in that meal plan as well as a bunch that have been created by several other dietitians who are experienced in this space. Um, the great part about this software is that it's free for dietitians um, and other physicians to use. Um, we helped we helped create it as well. Um, you the patient this is based on a patient payment um, plans. Um, there's more information about it if you click on these links, which again, you'll have access to after the presentation. I think this is a hugely beneficial software for a lot of reasons. I put some of the benefits here. There's over 40 recipes available in the plan. Everyone who's working on it is um, experienced in this field. Um, in addition, there's going to be different versions that you can filter by, you know, strictly vegetarian. You can modify based on the person's um, individual needs. All the nutrition facts are available. It automatically populates your grocery carts. It's got instructions, diet tips, and videos. It's customizable for your patients, which I think is huge. So 
I encourage you to follow the links and to look at um, what's available on Jean's site. I'm happy to connect you with her as well, but she's also available via email, which you'll find the information for on her site. So definitely check this out if you're interesting and if you're interested in accessing meal plans for your patients. Um, also, there's a ton of other resources that you can find. The National Kidney Foundation has an app, um, but also on flavus.com, uh, you will see a lot of inf you will find a lot of resources for chronic kidney disease patients, including recipes, many of which you'll also see in Jean Petrucci's plan. So if you're interested in viewing some of the recipes without signing up for the plan, you can find them on the Flavus website. Um, these are all tools, but I don't want to diminish the need for patients to seek the advice of a registered dietitian. I think we can all agree that patients really need support when they're following this sort of plan. So feel free to give your patients access to these things and make them aware. But really, really, I want them to be seeing you so that they're getting the best care. Um, there's also Flavus Kidney Friendly Medical Foods. Um, so to answer someone's question about low protein pizza crust, um, Flavus foods were designed for people with chronic kidney disease specifically in mind. So they are grain-based low protein foods, um, which are low in protein, sodium, potassium, and phosphorus. They're good sources of um, calories and fiber still, and they're mostly all vegan. Um, we've been using these foods in Italy for about five years now, and a lot, it really does help facilitate adherence to the diet. Um, you can purchase them all online at shop.flavus.com, but if you want to look at the nutritional profiles and how to use them first, um, feel free to check it out on flavus.com. Um, someone's asking about samples of the Flavus products, so that is a great question. I am happy to send samples of the Flavus products to you. You can just email me if you're interested. I am always willing to share them with um, healthcare providers. Um, so, and also at, at most nutrition shows, we will be at Fancy as well as ASN in the fall. So you'll, you can sample them there if you are there in person. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. What would a CKD meal plan look like for someone who likes meat and potatoes? So <laughs> this is certainly a challenge. Um, and I think really the education here involves a lot of discussion about portion control and preparation. So potatoes really, um, the concern is always potassium. And um, I think, you know, if a person doesn't have a high potassium level, you don't necessarily need to worry about their intake of potatoes, but you do want to encourage them to moderate it to be, you know, what you would consider a healthy amount so that they don't go overboard. With meat, um, you know, I always like to, to say, you know, it's, it's not all or nothing. You can have meat, but it has to be moderated in smaller in portions. And I think this is a good opportunity to educate on how plant-based proteins can taste so good. So it's really easy to convince someone when you've got a nice plant-based protein dish that tastes really delicious. And I think that's a huge benefit of culinary education. Um, could you clarify what nutrients are decreased in absorption with increase of fiber? So yeah, so when you consume a high fiber diet, um, and actually the, really the, the research shows that phosphorus and potassium um, levels in your blood are really affected by um, fiber intake. So for example, if you're consuming a high fiber diet, you're pulling out the potassium in the stool. And same thing with phosphorus. Um, studies consistently show that Phosphorus is more bioavailable and more easily absorbed when it's in the processed form. However, when it's, when it's consumed in conjunction, you know, in a plant-based food where you're consuming fiber and other properties and something called phytates, um, the phosphorus is drawn out with your stool. So it's really important that patients are consuming adequate fiber. You don't want a person to become, you know, to have maybe a, a hyperkalemia situation because they were very constipated. You know, all those toxins basically stay in the body. That's really the point there. Okay. Um, someone's asking for my email address again. I will 
I will be sending you all an email after this with your certificate and the slides, so you'll be getting my email when I email you. Okay. All right, and it looks like with that, I don't have any more questions. Um, again, you will all be getting some communication from me probably tomorrow and happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much for joining and I look forward to hearing all of your questions as they come in.